I want to thank you in front of everyone. Anytime I ever got to a spot over the last five years where I needed somebody to fill it, yeah, hey, would you do a seminar? And he's always told me yes. So, and of course, his seminars are pretty popular because he's got great subject matter and he knows what he's doing. So, it's been very good for me, and I want to thank him in front of everyone. Thank you, Ed. The best, it's really hard. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, from Texas, Mr. Ed Herbal's going to do a seminar on legals. He just happens to live there now. Yeah, well, that should be fine. Um, do I need this or can everyone hear? Yeah, I don't think you need it. Okay. Well, let me know if you need me to talk up. What? <laughs> um, so I thought today I would go through just some of the, you know, the last few years I've been doing what we call legal of the day on the chip board. Um, just some research that we do on new chips that we find and what I love about illegals and especially the, the smaller uh, clubs that we do research on is that this is all new information for the most part. Um, you know, the big guys, the, the Bugsy Siegel and all that, you know, they've got all these books written about them and there's really not a whole lot you can find out about. But these clubs are things that no one's ever heard of before. We find just amazing information on it. And I thought I would just showcase, um, we'll see how many we get through. I think I have about seven or eight here. Um, we may have to cut it short if it gets long. But um, you know, one thing I want to dedicate this, Gene Tremble, I think he's a friend to everyone in the illegals. He was the kind of guy who would just passionate about history and he was always pushing me to, you know, everything started usually with him. He'd say, can you take a look at this ID? Because he wasn't, you know, if you knew Gene, he wasn't real big on technical stuff. He didn't. <laughs> his, uh, his research was mostly, he would get a phone book and he would just cold call everyone in the phone book with the last name or whatever he was looking for. And that was the way he did his research. So he would call me to try to get a little more sophisticated and we did a lot of uh, research over the time, he and I. and. Um, he was always the guy who would push me to, you know, you know, see if you can find that and do this. And then now can you write it up? And we need to post it and everything. <laughs> so that's why I've been kind of a little uh, slow lately in the last year because I haven't had Gene to really push me, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to get better at that. So just want to dedicate all this to him because um, he's the one that usually would push me to, for, for most of these um, IDs. So just a quick map of a couple places we're going to hit today. Uh, I got. In Alabama, we've got a casino that was in a cave. And most of these have already been posted So um, over the last three to four years. So they may be, um, you may recognize some of them. Some of them, I'm going to go into a little more detail and show you a few more things that we found since then. So uh, we will have new information. Um, Chicago, we've got uh, a gangster there. Uh, in Kansas, a fun story, quick fun story about a widower. Selma, North Carolina, that's going to be another interesting one where a big explosion, we'll find that. Dallas, Texas, uh, Kennedy assassination connection, which Gene was just, he, he thought this was probably groundbreaking, like, you know, we're going to have the feds come looking for us for this, and it, it, it was, he's, he, was always a, he was always a little, you know, he thought we were always just doing groundbreaking work. Um, Hot Springs, Arkansas, the shortest life of a casino. Uh, Biloxi, a personal connection with um, some chips, and uh, rich, uh, just outside of Houston, I've got a, um, a place that I actually went to and did some groundwork there. And uh, so, you know, let's get started. Uh, <clears throat> the first one, this was uh, an illegal of the day I did back in August of 2014. It started with this chip, K. Uh, we went and got the ID from Mason and Company, and it comes back with this Fred Newman in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, 1937. It had an address on it, so we looked up the address. What we find is this Fred Newman, unfortunately the address came back as his home, and it didn't have his place of employment. So it didn't give a lot of information, so we had to dig deeper and try to find out if we could figure this out. Now one thing about the chip is instead of just being three initials, it actually has cave on it. So that gave us maybe an indication that 
if we dug into something with a cave, we might uh, be able to find it. So I go on some of my search engines. We're looking for the subject cave, along with gambling, around Birmingham, Alabama in 1937 when the chip was um, made. So we look, and we do get a hit in October 1937, Coleman Democrat, which is in Alabama, and we've got this Bangor cave is padlocked, and what it is is a nightclub that um, was raided in October 1937. So that gave us a hit to start researching. So just to show you where we are, um, we've got Alabama down here. About 30 miles north right here is where this club was. The newspaper's right there. And so what we find is there's actually a pretty long story that goes back to this cave that's in this mountain. And it was used by spelunkers since the early 1900s. And what these guys came in and thought they were gonna build this casino in this cave. So what they did is they spent $70,000 of 1937 money, which is wow. about 1.5 million today. And mm -hmm. what they did is they built this entire thing just in front of this big old hole in the cave. And uh, then they're gonna make this plush casino out of it. What they did inside, this is, there's very few pictures of the inside, but this is, they sandblasted the ground, they built, they poured concrete, this is a bar, and they, and they tried to seal up all these cracks in the wall. And um, one of the reasons why it cost so much is it was still leaking, so they ended up building a roof on top of the mountain itself to, to keep the water from leaking. So what they did is inside here is a big old dance floor. It's about 300 feet by 60 feet. And uh, they had an alcove that they sandblasted out to put the orchestra up on the wall. Huh. And then in the back room is where the casino was. And uh, what they did is they opened June 1937 and the Alabama governor immediately said, uh, talked to the sheriff and said, you need to close this place down. The sheriff said, okay. Two days later, he sent back to the governor and said, we've closed it down and it will not reopen. About a month, a month later, the Bangor Club, the operator said that we're gonna have a grand reopening. The governor said, to the sheriff that that club will open at the cost of your job, which the sheriff said, okay, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure he was on the tape, but <laughs> so <laughs> the governor comes back and gets a new sheriff and he's sworn in at midnight, July 31st, eight minutes later, that sheriff and his deputies go and they raid the club and they close it for good. Um, <clears throat> So the owners, uh, apparently they had already made back their money and so much more. I can't imagine how they made it back so fast because that was a lot of money back then, but they must have been doing some great action. So they ended up selling it to a, uh, some, they, they sold it to some other people who opened it as just a legitimate nightclub. And then this is a, a thing in the paper and I'll, I'll read just a few things. It, it's talking about the grand re reopening and uh, the crowds, of course, weren't there because there was no gambling. And I like what the, the uh, what he says is, the club now reminds me of a young lady who was questioned by a new friend, do you smoke? I don't, do you drink? I don't, do you have late dates? I don't. And they said, well, one would think you had no fun at all. And I don't. <laughs> so, unfortunately, the place didn't last that long. Well, not unfortunately, I mean, it just wasn't. Uh, they ended up making a bomb shelter out of it later. And um, it's been dilapidated now. I think they tried to sell it about 10 years ago for who knows what someone's going to do with it. But I think now it's just a place where kids go and put graffiti on the wall and do who knows what there. So that was from that one chip with Cave. That's what we came up with. And as far as I can tell, you know, there hasn't been much research into this. I mean, these are all um, articles that we just you know put together with this research, so I thought that was an interesting one. Um, we're going to move to Chicago. I found these tokens online, um, Bob McLaughlin, and it's got an address down there 
for um, Chicago. And when we started researching it, we found <coughs> this guy who, you know, he looks like a mobster. <laughs> um, but what Bob McLaughlin, he was actually a really smart guy. And his, his thing was not to use guns and force as much as to use his brain. And what he did is he was more like a businessman than a mob boss. And one of the first things that he did, 1926, he took over what was then the uh, Checker Cab Company in Chicago. And during this time, they were having what was called the uh, Taxi Cab Wars. And it was the Checker Cab versus the Yellow Cab. And what they would do is they started just trying to, um, you know, trying to get fares from each other, but then it turned into violence. And here's a, a thing, they, would, they tipped the arrival cab over and they would just cause chaos. There was intimidation. Uh, there was some murders. And um, so he was, you know, a, a union boss of this uh, company, and he actually became quite wealthy doing it, as one might imagine. Mm -hmm. And um, it was during this time he got wealthy and extremely powerful in the underworld. And uh, one of his main guys who was his muscle was his brother, Eugene Red McLaughlin, and he was what you would call the traditional gangster who did everything by force. He was um, Robert's main man who would lay down the law and take care of all his competition. Um, so Eugene, actually, he went to jail for uh, a kind of a brutal kidnapping and his brother, Robert, using his pull with the police actually got him out of jail, but unfortunately, he probably shouldn't have done that because as soon as he got out, Eugene was assassinated. And, um, you know, one interesting story is someone could probably figure out that he was in trouble because, um, well, this is, he's found dead. Uh, his girlfriend at the time was nicknamed the Kiss of Death Girl. Who, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jim uh, is that an old girl <laughs> um, So actually, Eugene was her sixth boyfriend in recently who had been murdered. So she, she had five boyfriends before who were all killed in gangland shooting. So Eugene was number six. So going back to Robert, after uh, 1931, he gave up his job at the cab company and he opened this, um, this bar uh, where the, uh, the tokens were from and um, opened a casino there. In 1941, it was raided. There were 50 people that were arrested. 1942, it was raided again. 88 people were in the casino at the time. So it was, you know, it was kind of a big operation. These chips were found with the um, tokens, and you know, I suspect it's Robert McLaughlin on it, um, which is good that we found him with the others because we would, yeah, we would have never known what uh, those chips were because there's no records for them. So those were most likely chips used in the casino. Um, so Robert uh, McLaughlin, his luck ran out in 1942, where. Um, the, the week before, he had a mysterious fire that had broken out in the, uh, the restaurant where he, just that day, had received $20,000 of stolen liquor. So it was suspected that that was probably had something to do with it. Um, soon after, he was taken on a ride and his body was dumped out. And uh, there was a bunch of theories on what happened. One of them, the main thing, is the, uh, what was left of the Capone gang was... Um, was upset that he was trying to muscle into the bookie business as well as a casino and had stolen liquor, so that was most likely his, his downfall. Um, today, this is, it's on the corner here. Um, what I thought was funny, this is a Google map, and for some reason we've got a donut man <laughs> just sitting on the right side. I love that. <laughs> just, I don't know. So. <laughs> so even today, shenanigans are going on. <laughs> Do you know what intersection that is? Um, yeah, I've got the, well, the address is... Yeah, no, it was... 
Uh, 1958 North Avenue is the address of that. I'm not sure what the intersection is. Yeah, in Chicago. So, I just look for the donut guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's probably, he's probably still there now. <laughs> so, uh, this is a quick story. Um, we got these TJM chips. They were ordered in uh, 1937 to the State Line Tavern in Kansas City, Kansas. They had also ordered TIM chips and, they, um, and another order with M and Company, CO. I have never seen those chips before, but all three of those were ordered in 1937 to the State Line Tavern. It didn't take, uh, it wasn't very hard to figure out what that TJM ordered, Thomas J. Metzger. He was the owner of the State Line Taverns, and he actually owned two of them. One was on West Street. The other was on the address that the chips were delivered to, and there's an ad for um, for it. Now, the, the name State Line Tavern was appropriately named because it was right on the border. And I think um, the more you do research into this, it's usually no coincidence that these places are right on the border of a county or state line because they're usually on the more favorable side, mm -hmm. and they can also draw from um, you know, the other side. So, uh, one so interesting story, Thomas J. Metzger, unfortunately, as soon as the chips were ordered, he died of probably natural causes. Uh, he was only 36 years old, and when you're trying to figure out maybe what happened to him, you maybe look at his wife, who's 25 years old, <laughs> and she was known as a beauty and also had kind of a, a wild streak with her. She was known to take uh, police on high-speed chases over the border to eat tickets. And um, what we'll find out here is she inherited the um, clubs and kept on with the uh, kind of the notorious side to it. She did have a casino in it, and also she was selling liquor illegally. And uh, one thing I found humorous in all these stories is they were focused on her and what she looked like. Because, you know, it, a lot of these illegal things were about men, but then you get a, a pretty woman and then all of a sudden they're talking. In this article, she's uh, described as, you know, a brunette tavern owner. Um, a little later, um, she's hit for um, some liquor violations and she's called a, a, a dazzling blonde. Uh, <laughs> a couple months later and then here at the end of the joints which w when it was rated she was just a blonde brunette at the time so um, she ended up having to sell the the places and uh this guy uh joe stevens took over afterwards and there was no mention of his hair color or <laughs> <laughs> so so that was uh, you know her quick her uh, her quick ownership of the clubs. I just I just think that's funny because it's you know the, the guys are always you know talking about all the stuff and her it's just her looks and I always thought that was funny. Um, so we're going to move to North Carolina and this isn't so much a story about gambling although they did have a casino in it but it just this is one of those weird stories where you start researching it and the weird alleys it goes down and just. Well, I guess we'll just get into it. Um, these chips were ordered by an L. Gherkin, later to find out Lloyd Gherkin, at the Catch Me I Inn, Selma, North Carolina. And uh, the Catch Me I Inn was a travel lodge that was just kind of out in the middle of nowhere on um, U.S. Uh, Highway 301 between Smithfield and Raleigh, North Carolina. So there's really not a whole lot there. Um, it was really just a temporary travel stop. Here's a, a picture of the Gherkin's Tavern. Here's Lloyd and I'm not sure who that person is, but um, the, the Gherkin's was known. It was an oyster bar it had, and had cabins in the back for overnight stay, which we'll show in a minute. But um, Lloyd had some issues. He was selling uh, whiskey illegally in the place. Yeah, he had not much of a spell check there, I guess, back in the day. Um, but the funny story here is the agent showed up with a search warrant 
and uh, Lloyd said, okay, well, you know, let me move my car out so you guys can search. And he said, okay. So he pulled his car out and drove away. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I, don't, I don't get what, why they would let him do that. But, um, <laughs> so the, this story, like I said, it, it brings you to weird places because I, it it's, was dead center in what was this bizarre tragedy that happened in, uh, in the town. So take back to 1942, um, and uh, Fort Bragg is nearby, and they had a shipment of 30,000 pounds of explosives that were going to Fort Bragg. And that truck got in an accident with another car right out in front of uh, the Catch Me I Inn, and it caught on fire. And so this is many dead. Actually, there, there were just a few dead in it. But what happened is the, the uh, truck burned for a couple hours. So they were able to get most of the people out. For some reason, the people at um, Gherkins were doing other things and didn't want to leave. So they kept partying. <laughs> but um, so two hours, this thing burned. And finally, it exploded. And here's the crater that was left, it was, um, it was 50 feet across and 20 feet deep. And the, the only people that died, there were, there were two in a hotel across the street, but um, two of the other people that died were actually in a car that just wouldn't stop and they wanted to keep going and they were going right by it when it blew up. So not as many people died as, as you would suspect from this, but it was quite devastating. This is the hotel <coughs> that was right across the street from Gergen's. And after the explosion, all that was left was a chimney. Um, and here I've got, this is actually a video. And uh, yeah, this is a video taken the morning after. That's the gas station that was right next door. And there's Gergen's Tavern. You can see the, uh, the arches there. That's what's left, and the uh, cabins in the back are all collapsed. Where in the world would you find that thing? Yeah. That was on YouTube. I don't know who <laughs> uploaded it, but. But um, amazing find. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah, going back to this, this is Gergen's right behind it. So, I mean, that's how close it was to, you know, total devastation. But um, so that's the story of that. So there's not really a whole lot that goes with gambling in it. Obviously, they had it, but it's just kind of just a weird, you know, where did that come from? So okay, we got eight thirty. <clears throat> so real quick, this this won't take long. This these chips, CWM, they were delivered to CW Merchantson in Dallas, Texas, 1933. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, Murchison was actually a, a pretty famous guy. He uh, was born at the uh, the end of the the last or 1895. He was born and. At an early age, he started trading oil leases in Texas. That's what we've got. And uh, by the age of 30, he had amassed a fortune of about $5 million, which he then reinvested in a bunch of other things. He was in publishing, manufacturing, <coughs> uh, pipelines. And uh, he was immensely wealthy by the time that he ordered these chips in 1933. And, um, you know, one thing, these, these chips, Obviously, probably were not used for an illegal casino because this guy had no, no reason to do that. But, I mean, it's interesting to think of how much money those chips were used for in just his own personal games with his multi-billionaire friends. But um, the one thing, and Gene loved about this story, and like I said, he, he liked some weird <laughs> stuff, but going 30 years ahead, 1963, um, Murchison has a party at his house, and some of the people he invited, he had Vice President Lyndon Johnson, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, Richard Nixon, all these guys were there, Jack Ruby was there, 
And uh, according, according to a biography written by Madeline Brown, who was a uh, self-proclaimed uh, mistress of Lyndon Johnson, apparently the boys had a closed door meeting and then Johnson comes out, and this is in her book, he says, after tomorrow, those goddamn Kennedys will never embarrass me again. That's no threat, that's a promise. And Kennedy was killed the next day in Dallas. Jeez. So supposedly, uh, you know, whether what happened behind closed doors, who knows? But you have a party with all these guys, and the next day the president's killed is a little weird. So, yeah, Gene, you know, the, the chips really, you know, are, are three decades removed from this, but still is a connection that, you know, is crazy. Um, just, and to take it forward, uh, Murchison, he lived into his uh, 70s and he left a fortune to his son, Clint Murchison Jr. here, about $500 million, in which he immediately spent it on stupid things. Uh, he, he didn't have the business sense of his dad, and by the time Jr. was done, he had, had amassed a debt of $500 million dollars. So it was a, a one billion dollar swing. Um, one of the questionable investments he did is, here's Murchison, there's Tom Landry, he actually purchased the uh, Dallas Cowboys, which, you know, being from Houston, that isn't really something I, I, don't, I don't really particularly care for that investment. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's just a quick story of those chips and you know the, the guy who bought them. Um, okay, so here's another, the Colonial Club. This is one that I really like and I like it for a bunch of reasons. Um, here's the card of the chips that were ordered and it's, it's a busy card and there's a lot of stuff going on. And so just kind of take you through my, my workflow of how I would go about researching this. Um, there's a couple things at a glance. You can look at this card and you can see a couple things. First, the chip stamp is different from the location. So to think that these were used in the, the Park Cedar courts um, might not be the case because it's, it's clearly marked colonial. Um, another thing that's kind of weird is these were returned after seven months. So if they were chips that they didn't want originally, you would think they would come back before that. And uh, no black chips were returned. They were ordered but not returned. So there's three kind of red flags that say maybe this isn't just a misprint order that was returned. Maybe these were actually used. So again, I'm going to go look at some search. I'm going to look for the Colonial uh, and Murphy here. We got B. Murphy is the um, person who ordered the chips. So I'm going to look for Colonial, Murphy, Hot Springs, Arkansas is where they were sent to around 1948. And what we get is we got the Colonial Club and we actually have a hit on B. Murphy, which is kind of remarkable that that all comes together. So, and, and this was 1948. So we know that that's probably where these chips were used to show where we are. We've got Hot Springs down here. Um, we've got a county line here, and just feet over the county line, again, is where about 15 miles away from Hot Springs is where this was ordered, or where the, these chips were, uh, the, the club was located. Uh, right before I left, Wayne Threadgill sent me this picture of, he just found this, and it's a picture of the Colonial. And as you can see, it's just kind of built out in the middle of nowhere. It's not a uh, city, but I thought that was kind of neat. I mean, he sent that to me like two days ago when he saw that I was doing this. I love getting stuff like that. So, the quick story, grand opening, January 17th, 1948. Um, we have the grand opening and it's raided on that same night, just hours after it opened. And uh, the judge, you know, said this was a public nuisance. And it didn't reopen and a month and a half later, the judge finally says, it's never gonna reopen. And not only that, but we own the club and everything in it. And so the next day, the sheriff shows up at the club to see what exactly they own now. Oh, the, the judge, he said this is one of the worst evils of the day. And 
if they had come to him, he would have said that, you know, I could have saved you some money because you're, you're, you're not going to be able to open it. But um, like I said, the sheriff shows up the next day to take inventory of what they own. And lo and behold, the place has been burglarized and everything's gone. <laughs> so uh, they took everything, the furniture, the tables, chairs, linens, silverware, everything's gone. So, um, and so, you know, it's been burglarized, but six months later, those chips are returned from the guy who ordered them. So obviously, you know, something's going on. Uh, and just a, a quick wrap up, uh, a few months later, subpoenas go unserved. They can't find any of those guys. Uh, you know, big shocker there. And uh, <laughs> they just lack of evidence. But, you know, it, they got what they wanted. They, they, the club's gone. So, um, so they, they did their job. But I just thought that was funny how. So the club was only operated for a day. But they have, you know, I mean, it was legit. They had gambling, obviously, because they, they raided it and those chips were used. And so we, we go to the card again, and you see it says over here. So you flip the card over, and you've got kind of the second life of these chips. And what this is, is all the people that bought these chips after they were returned. Like I said, there were no blacks returned, which, you know, they could have been confiscated or they were just lost. Who knows why, but uh, none of the chips were returned. So, you know, I can't let anything just lie unknown. So I've got to dig into it a little deeper. There's kind of some fun stuff. I'm not going to go into detail here. Uh, the, this A. Rand out of Chicago, he only bought 25 blue chips. I'm not sure what he did. Um, I think if anyone should be worried, maybe this guy should, who ordered gray and blue chips. And for a, a place just outside of um, Chicago, Forest Lake is a, a suburb, and they had lots of casinos. So, you know, they, he, that guy might be a little worried about what that guy wanted with those 25 blue chips. Um, another order, this Queenie, I, I don't know what that is. He, mm -hmm. he ordered 200 red chips. There's not a lot of information. Um, J.V. McCallum uh, out of Bunky, Louisiana, he ordered 500 of the red chips. Uh, you look in the, the Taylor and Company records, and this is the, um, the Kefauver uh, committee had asked that uh, Taylor send all their, uh, their records of their directories. And so they, they sent that, and we've got copies of what they sent. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we get some of this information. So this J.D. McCallum, um, the club playtime is the club that they were down there in Bunky. As a, a matchbook from Club Playtime, it was actually rated a few times, so it was definitely had a lot of gambling going on there. Um, then John Merritt, he ordered the three chips, and um, I think these are probably where the chips that are in the hobby came from Merritt's place because we have these three colors, and he's the only guy that ordered those three colors. He didn't order any grays. We, we've never seen the grays and everyone else didn't order all three. So I'm assuming that these went from the Colonial to this place that he owned there, the, the Tropic Lounge in Ottawa, um, Illinois. And um, he did have, eight months before he was arrested, his, his club was raided and he was um, arrested for gambling. So I'm sure these were probably replacements for the chips that he lost in that. And um, then the last one, this guy, uh, Francis, out of Burt's Bar, Sulphur, Louisiana, he actually ordered other chips too. I've never seen these chips, FK, um, for his place down there. So these chips had a second life, but I think the, the first life was actually the, the funniest. Just, I mean, one day. I mean, the, the place was open just for one day. So I'm sure they sent them back and they were just brand new. Um, how are we doing on Sunday? Good. Okay, so this is an interesting story, and this is kind of a personal connection I had with this story, the Key Club out of Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, this goes back to 1998, and we had a show down in Biloxi, Mississippi. I know some of you who were old-timers went to this. Um, here's a picture of Gene 
we've got Rick Paulus here who had a bunch of clubs and he brought some of these chips. We you know had him sign some chips. And uh, Verda Lee, who was actually uh, the, the federal magistrate who had ordered the uh, the raids on these clubs back in the day. We, we just had a, a good time and they, they spoke a little bit and um, it was a fun little small show. And uh, so I was setting up and this is kind of a weird story. I've got a table there and this little old guy comes in and he goes, um, I'm just wondering if maybe you have some of my chips from an old club I used to own. He goes, my name's um, John Romeo and I used to own the Key Club in Biloxi. And I'm like, well, I never heard of that, but you can look through my stuff. Maybe I've got something. And he goes, okay. So he starts looking through, and about a minute later, another guy walks in and says, um, I wonder if you could help me with these chips that I found on the ground after Hurricane Camille decades ago. And I was like, well, I, I don't, we didn't have the records uh, available for, for these Jones molds back in the day. so. I was like, I don't know. And John Romeo says, hey, that's my chip. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, I'm thinking I'm definitely getting hustled here. There's, there's, no, there's no way that, that, that this, is, this is legit. And uh, so I like, okay, well, you know, I don't know. What, what are you, are you trying to sell these chips? And he's like, oh no, just take one. So he gave one to me. He gave a few to John Romeo. He said, yeah, you know, I just found these decades ago. I was just wondering if you guys knew anything about it. So, so there was no way, right? Well, we find later that these chips were actually ordered to John Romeo. I mean, who would have thought that was a real name? So yeah, these chips were actually ordered by John. Now, he, uh, he's since passed away and he says, this says it was canceled, but I think he probably just had someone else pick it up or something because I mean, this, this story checks out, but, um, I thought that was a weird story. I couldn't believe it. So anyway, I, I took John's information and over the next few years, I contacted him and I interviewed a few times and I actually saw him a couple times and he would just send me stuff. These are pictures from inside the key club. This is the bar with you got the key here. There's John. It's his wife. Uh, his, his little daughter he used to say that croupiers and uh, cocktail waitresses make great babysitters. They would just bring him in, but, you know, he had a big crafts table here. But, and he would just send me stuff, and it was just amazing. Um, you know, a super nice guy. They, he said they had uh, five poker tables, two blackjack tables, two crafts tables, and 12 slot machines. So, you know, this was a, a big operation. He later sent me other chips that he found in, like, a lockbox or something in his house, Key Club. We've got those orders, and that's John's as well. Um, but just a neat guy that, uh, you know, came out of nowhere. Now he, of course, talked a lot too in what these guys do. And he claims that Jane Mansfield had actually been drinking in this place the night that she was killed after uh, she left yeah. Alexi. So I don't know if that's a true story or not, but he claims. Of course, being in Biloxi and having illegal casinos, he uh, was, uh, frequently raided. This is a, an article um, and some pictures is at the Key Club. They're taking out some illegal booze and this is uh, a guy with an ax, a gardener with an ax that's breaking up one of his tables. And um, this was a big raid that they said closed down and don't ever reopen. And the next day, all the clubs are back in business. So it's really no big deal. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, the one thing that he, he couldn't deal with, and this was 1969, Hurricane Camille, and here's a picture of it, and there's, here's the track. It's a Category 5 when it's going into Biloxi right then. And, uh, you know, what the guardsmen couldn't take care of, the, the, the hurricane did. This is, this is what's left of the key club. So that was the final day of uh, the key club, and then, you know, that's the chips were pretty much blown all over town, and this guy found a few and that started this whole this whole process of you know them reading about this chip show in the newspaper and showing up at the exact same time and asking the exact I mean if they hadn't been there I would wouldn't have a clue so um, 
That's the interesting story, and that's that's one more personal story that I had because I knew these guys and I did a lot of interviewing, and that's not a luxury we have with a lot of these illegal casinos because these guys, for the most part, aren't around when you think about it. You know, a casino from the mid '40s, and these guys are maybe in their 20s to 30 back then. I mean, they're going to be pushing 100 now, so there's just not a lot of them left, unfortunately. Um, so then, going to something closer to home here, Richmond, Texas is right outside of Houston. It's hard to read, but that says BMC, and what we get is uh, BC McKnight, so it's BC and then McKnight in the middle. Um, sometimes those initials are like that. These were ordered in 1931, and um, at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of information on this, so I find out of the, um, the Galveston newspaper, we've got a case where there's a, uh, a liquor conspiracy case, and in it, it says, uh, B.C. McKnight, proprietor of the Domino Hall on Calhoun Street in Richmond, Texas, and that actually tells us a whole lot about this place. Um, and then, furthermore, it, it talks about this conspiracy that is um, an interesting one that, and this is another one where you start doing one thing and then you find something on the side that takes you to some really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so just to show you where we are, we're here in Houston, right here, uh, Richmond right there, grew up right there. So I, I used to always go to Richmond. They had a, a big library where we could do our research back in school when people actually went to libraries back in the day. <laughs> um, so I used to go there and I had no idea it had such this, this seedy reputation that it does. But what they have is, it said a, a domino parlor on Calhoun Street, which was uh, another name for what they called Mud Alley. And it, what it is, is it's the street here, it's got railroad tracks right in the middle that are raised up, so all the water accumulates in the streets and they were all mud, this is back, you know, 1899, and so it got this reputation as Mud Alley, and nobody wanted to put a place here that was a legitimate place, so what happened is this was just full of bars, casinos, and this was kind of the rough part of town, and it's something that actually stayed the rough part of town pretty much forever. Um, our story then moves, the, the, like I said, there wasn't much on McKnight, but this mud alley and this liquor conspiracy had um, this sheriff Collins. <clears throat> uh, he was actually kind of a he was a guy who always seemed to get the work done. Um, he was kind of a big deal. In 1921, he um, he solved a murder case, and then he had this knack for finding these stills all over town. No one else could, but he did. And uh, what we find out later is the reason he knew where all these stills were is because he was the kingpin of bootlegging. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what happened is these guys, when they stopped paying, he would go raid them, and he would, he would take them down. Well, so what happened in, in 1930, they decided that they were gonna get this guy, and uh, they raided Calhoun Street, knocked down all the places, um, including McKnight's place, but uh, this sheriff also had a couple places in there. And um, so they went after him. In 1930, he was acquitted on a small liquor charge, but they were able to accumulate enough information to bring him up on an indictment for uh, federal crimes. And so they wanted to get him on the liquor ring. Um, so what the witnesses said that he was really de facto boss of all, everything that was illegal in the town. And um, they said that he was paid off. And uh, so they went after him. In July 1931, they were deadlocked in a mistrial, which, you know, most of those guys were probably, you know, friends of his, and that's how things were done back then. Um, the, the, the state said they were gonna retry him. They set it for November, and then unfortunately, a couple months later, before they could retry him, he was found dead in his home, and they said he was suffering from nervous trouble and had been in bad health, but they found out later that he was actually, he, 
he poisoned himself instead of going through this. So it's kind of a, a sad ending for for this whole uh, thing. But it's one of those little side plots where you've got this one guy for a chip, but it opens up this whole crazy story. And of course, I'm I'm summarizing this in you know a couple minutes, but it's actually you know there's a lot of information that's fun. Um, so this guy. He did an interview. He was actually mayor of Richmond. He was mayor for 63 years. He was the longest sitting mayor, 1949, and he died in 1912, still in office. Um, it's funny. You live long enough, they're putting statues up of you that you pose <laughs> mayor for. It. But he did an uh, interview back in uh, 1985 where he talked about Mud Alley, because it, it's still, well, not so much now, but Back in 1985, it was still actually a thing where he says prostitution gambling has gone on since the beginning of time and always will go on. The attitude of Richmond has been, if that's what you're looking for, go to Mud Alley. If you're not looking for that, stay away from Mud Alley. So his attitude was, you know, keep the vice in one place. And if you don't want to do that, then don't go there. But his attitude was, you know, if you keep it in one place, then it's not bothering anyone else. So he had kind of a, an open mind about it, and that's, um, that's why this mud alley had stayed the way it had been for you know, a century. So I, I jumped in the car and went over um, South Calhoun Street, mud alley. It's now a historical district, of course. Now the, the, it's a little small, but these places are still just the dilapidated buildings, but it's kind of interesting to see what maybe they were back in the day. Um, you can see there's still a railroad track that goes through it. It's paved now, but I'm sure Houston gets a share of water. I'm sure it's still a mess. But um, anyway, I thought that was that was fun to go down and see it. So the last thing is something new that I just found last week. These chips came out of Gene Trimble's um, collection that I hadn't seen before. And again, you get one of these really busy cards and these are the kind of cards I love because you get to really dig into it. If there's, you know, if it's too easy, then there's no challenge to it. So, what we're looking at is where were these originally delivered? And you've got up there. I had the actual original card pulled because I thought maybe this was just scanned and didn't pick up the top. But this is actually it had been cut a long time ago. So you can see this is care of and. The pump something in Pompano, Florida. <clears throat> so again, um, one of the first places I looked is back in those Taylor records, and there's a um, an entry for Dick Guest at the Romp Room, and the address you can see is the same address. So that's apparently the Romp Room. And that's where these were originally ordered, and then we we're going to get to it, but you know, and then it's resold later. So I started digging in. Dick Guest, I didn't know if he was involved in Pompano gambling. We got a, an article here if you look past the uh, turkey driving the tractor. <laughs> <laughs> you get a, a mile north of Pompano, a lavish decorated former boat is being fitted out. One of the owners is Dick Guest, a New York gambler. So it's just this small little article down here. Um, so start looking into it, and it's, you know it says it's the romp room, but actually what we're finding is a pump room. And here's our pump club. So this is an, uh, an ad for this new club that's opening for Dick Guest. So that's apparently where these chips were going to be used is this pump club. Well, so what, what is the Palm Club? What they found one morning on a, uh, a local poet in Pompano, his land, this, what you can't see here is this is actually uh, a boat. And this is more to, this is the shore here. And this thing shows up one morning and everyone's like, well, you know, that's weird. So they, they start digging in, and that's where they find Dick Guest. And what this is, is an actual club. And inside this thing, you're going to see 150 people. There's modern furniture. There's wood-burning fireplaces. Um, they've got French cuisine and an orchestra. 
it, it always amazes me the size of these places. And it's like you got a dance floor and you got a casino. I, I just this looks like a little house to me. But I, I'm assuming they would have an orchestra one night and maybe you know something the next night. So this is. So that's that's the the pomp club. Well, you go back to this thing, the the, the order form, and you've got they were ordered in January, 11th, and they were returned a little over a month later. So, again, you're wondering were these ever even used because it's such a short time. What would have happened between those two times that um, would make them return these chips? And what we have is the club actually did open and February 15th, one of the owners of the club, not Dick Guest, but his co-owner who owned a third of it, was suing him to stop the gambling there because he was afraid these, uh, the um, authorities were gonna come in and, and confiscate his stuff. So what we have is the reason these chips were returned is because gambling stopped around the 15th. So I, I'm pretty sure that these were used I mean, they had them for over a month of gambling, so I can be rest assured that these are actual, originally Florida chips. Um, so then just a, a quick afterlife of this, we've got these were, the big order went to this other place that's uh, kind of cut off at the top, but you can kind of see it's Clark's pool room, and sure enough, there is a uh, Art Strange Clark pool room. Um, address in the, the records and uh, Art Strange. Here's a, just a quick article of um, his place was arrested. They did seize, <coughs> seize Chips' as evidence, so apparently it was used. Um, but the, for the last thing in here, I, I love this note, uh, to protect Art Strange, do not sell the remainder of the checks in Illinois, which then a couple months later they go and they sell to two people in Illinois. <laughs> 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 So, so that's it. Um, those are just, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, just, you know, I, I love this kind of stuff. I mean, this is better than Al Capone or, you know, anything. Because it's like, this is new, brand new stuff that I would have never found if I hadn't been looking in there. It kind of breaks my heart to think of all the records that we don't have with BC Wills and all that kind of stuff because, I mean, there's just unlimited stories out there. But that's kind of, kind of my passion is trying to find this undiscovered stuff. So, anyway, appreciate it. Yeah. Where do you get all these newspapers? Are you a member of some? Yeah, I do have a couple pay sites. Now, Google will pull up a lot of um, information, but I do use uh, a two. I have su subscriptions to newspaperarchives.com and I think newspapers.com and um, they have a lot of papers but what I'm finding is there's a lot now that are going behind their own separate paywalls. So if you went to like the Miami Herald I think has its own thing where you can either get a subscription to it or they say um, you have a, a time limit or you can download like 30 articles or something. <coughs> I know one, I was doing Seattle, I was looking at something in Seattle and they had 24 hours where you could look. So I just went and just downloaded everything gambling. Just, I, I didn't even look at it. I would just, just, just accumulate it. Um, I'll tell you one funny story, we were talking about newspapers and, and you know, I use them up here and, I, and if you read my articles, you, you see I put it in there, but then I'll, I'll kind of say a little summary because I know a lot of people don't like reading just a huge article. Gene, of course, loved the huge articles, and he would just post just constantly. Um, <clears throat> well, he would ask me to look up something, and I would, I would send him the article, and I'd crop it out and just send it to him. And one time, I was in a hurry, and what I do is I download the entire page originally because it's got the headline, and I can see the date and what paper and everything. So I said, okay, here it is, and um, you know, it's down in the left corner. So. Uh, you know, read it. And he comes back and says, hey, uh, can you send me the rest of the paper? And, you know, it's like a 1934 paper. And I'm like, oh, it must be more stories that I haven't. Well, it ends up he was just reading the paper. He just wanted to <laughs> 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 
1934, he because you know there's a story here, you know about you know some something, and, but he just wanted to read it. He just loved the history. It didn't matter if it was gambling or not. And so, you know, he would hit me up at work all the time, and he, he looked this at so I just didn't have time for it. I'd just send him the whole page, and I just knew that would take him a couple hours to get through. So, you know, that's kind of our our, our two things. I like to summarize it. He likes to think that everyone's as interested as he is. Uh, yeah. How many little IDs are in the new gaming table? Uh, they should be all. That last one wasn't because I just did it last right. week. But um, yeah, David, you know, David's pretty good about keeping up with that. So all those IDs are in there. Yeah. Okay. So I'm real green about illegal. Uh -huh. So they, they used to exist. They still do, right? Yeah. So they get their tables. They get their space and they make their chips and they they're just not getting a license the licenses yeah because it's illegal you can't get a license oh yeah, yeah and he, in most of these states you, you can't well you could back then it's so what's the, the, the longest that any of these places stay open well i mean in kentucky they stay open for you know decades indiana you know they, how is that well, I mean, you know, but yeah, you, you pay off the right people. But you know, like I said, that mud alley thing. I mean, that went on for a century. I mean, they, you know, like well, who know? Yeah, who know? It's illegal over there, but you keep it over there, and you know, legitimate businesses over here, and we'll kind of let it go. I'm sure there's someone to get paid something. But um, yeah, you, most of these, all these places had protection of some kind. Back in those days, $20,000 was a lot of money. Yeah. But are you sure a candidate should spend $20,000 to win a $9,000 a year job? You should, you should yeah. For that. yeah, and if you didn't pay off someone, you're closed down in a day or a month. You know, I mean, these places that were short lived didn't have that protection, but others, yeah. If you were under his protection, they had to raid places just to have a show of force. And, but they would give you a call ahead of time so there wasn't anyone in there that shouldn't, you know, there's no politicians or you know, shouldn't craft. And they'd come in, they'd raid, they'd take some stuff, and then get right back, you know. And they would pay their $20 fine or whatever, and it was just part of the business. But um, for the most part, yeah, they were, they didn't keep in back. Um, with legal gambling being so prevalent now, uh, obviously, illegal clubs really are not a thing anymore. Uh, can I ask, uh, if I'm wrong, please let me know, but what are the most recent uh, illegal clubs that have been out there? there every city is going to have um, card rooms and they're, they're, they're poker rooms, really, but they're I know Houston, we just started opening up some, what they say are legal now, but um, just up to a year ago, they were just poker. I, I don't know any place now that has like roulette, and I'm sure people shoot craps in places, but uh, it's mostly poker rooms, and they're, you know, they have chips and and everything, but they're kind of, you know, they're they're illegal, but and but they, they've got you know cops working doors, and it's kind of the same thing where it's it kind of they know it goes on, and maybe if they get too big, they'll you know put them down a little bit, but. Uh, every every city has illegal poker rooms still. Yeah, everyone. But I don't. But I don't know these. You know, roulette and you know all that fun stuff back in the day. I don't. I don't. Most of that stuff ended either out in the sixties or seventies. Yeah, sixties mostly. A lot of those went out. Tom. Yeah. Uh, the question about how these were allowed to operate in Mississippi. Uh, John Romeo is a good example. I was on, on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, which in the 60s um, was a really popular tourist destination before Hurricane Camille. 
And John Romeo was one of many clubs down there that had illegal gambling. And plus, a lot of them had big tag games. It was quite a, quite a casino atmosphere. But the, the local law enforcement, and particularly the governor, uh, said this is okay as long as nobody complains, pretty much. You have to remember at that time, not only was, was uh, gambling illegal, but the liquor was even illegal in Mississippi. Uh, and so, as long as, the, as long as no one complained, you know, big ticket people complained, it was okay. But, like I said, they had to go in every once in a while and just shut places down. Yeah. And in the early 60s, we had a governor, Governor Ross Barnett, who was really, he, he was the hardest governor and pretty much brought the end to it at that point. And he's the one who ordered those raids. Don Romeo ended up closing up that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. To tie into this question here about, uh, roulette and stuff, we have in Detroit area suburbs, um, they have blackjack, they do have some roulette, they do have uh, uh, cherry poker rooms. Yeah. But yet, um, the feds or the state will come in and shut them down, I should say the, the state will, uh, for illegal tax stuff that they're hiding and doing things like that, and they shut down a couple of big uh, cherry poker rooms. So. Is it legit? Yeah. Is it illegal? You know, just the run, the guys running the place, managing it, are still. Yeah. They push it. I mean, now in Houston, we just have now uh, some poker rooms that they're not taking a rake, but you pay for the chair, and it's an hourly rate. So you go in twenty bucks an hour, you you get a chair, and supposedly they say that's legal, and they're. Not, not supposed to serve alcohol, but they do, but they're giving it away, but it's like you bought a premium seat instead, you know? And, and so, they're, until someone complains, they're going to keep pushing it, but supposedly that's what they've got now. I haven't been on one yet, but um, they're always on their voice. Are going to be rival places that could be the plane? Oh, I'm sure, yeah. 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 And it, it, it's funny, because I actually, I actually have a, an article that's half written that I, I keep on to send in um, of just all the lawsuits from these women whose husband went in and just spent, you know, I gave him money to buy a taxi, to buy a taxi cab and he went to uh, the, the Arrowhead in, in Saratoga and spent it on the roulette wheel instead. So now she's suing the Arrowhead because her husband was a bonehead. And, you know, I've, you know, I've got like, you know, eight articles of just that same thing. Yeah, it's fun. Anything else? Yeah, that's